audience. Um, my name is Terry Higashiyama. I'm head of the Community Services Division. And we are here tonight to bring you up to date on all of our capital projects that are currently uh, moving forward or, or getting ready to start, and our major maintenance projects also that is a different category, but it is about taking care of the assets here in the city. Uh, speaking tonight, Kelly Beamer will be talking about the golf course and the parks. Uh, Leslie Betlock will be talking about a lot of the planning and the bigger projects that we have going on that actually are some of them are rolling forward from 2013. And then Peter Renner will uh, cover the facilities, the things that are going on, and we certainly encourage any questions. And if we don't have the answers, we will get back with you. And then Greg Zimmerman will be presenting right after us. So I will turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, Council President Person and Council Members, Kelly Beamer, Parks and Golf Course Director. Um, as we have up on our first slide today, we're going to cover the golf course first. Just, um, just a brief reminder, the golf course is an enterprise fund. Noted up there that the, the um, dollars that go into our CIP account are actually funded from the green fee revenue account. Uh, right now we are setting aside $50,000 annually to go into the 424 account, which is the CIP <coughs> fund. Um, I know that you're excited to hear that in 2015, finally coming up, that the loan for the clubhouse driving range and golf course improvements will be paid in full. And then um, that amount that goes into the um, CIP fund will increase uh, once that fund is paid off. So we'll be able to um, address some of the development type projects that have been in our long range plan. Currently we are uh, splitting the 50,000 to um, just the major maintenance portion of the golf courts, which would be grounds and uh, building infrastructure. Kelly? <coughs> Kelly? Yes. About how much uh, a year then is our loan payment? Currently our loan payment is just under $410,000 annually. Um, again, I believe it's towards the end of the summer. I have to confirm with Ewan uh, when the final payment in 2015 will be mature. Okay. So that that will give us, and, and I want to reiterate to the public, it's so important, and you did a really good job of bringing it up, that this is an enterprise fund, which means that it has to, the golf course has to pay for its own way. And so now if they, as they get ready to get this money in, then they are very judicious on how they spend it, and, we, and, and they keep it in good shape. But it's money that we generate that we put back into the course which makes us one of the most popular golf courses in the country thank you yes the enterprise fund is self-sustaining like as you said so everything all the operations are supported by the revenue that's generated from the golf course and as we had mentioned um, some of the long range plans that have been deferred um, some of the the uh, bigger development plans such as green redevelopments, some irrigation issues and things like that will be addressed after um, our loan is matured and we have more into the fund. So to address briefly then um, some of the items that we do take care of in the $50,000 that we do set aside um, are things such as cart path patching which you can see off on the right here with the arrow. Um, mostly from tree root upheavals and some water damage, but this wreaks havoc on the carts themselves. So to um, keep those areas as smooth as possible also helps with the maintenance of the golf carts and the longevity of those as well. Um, aerators for our ponds helps keep algae and microorganisms out, uh, reduces the amount of chemicals if we ever have to use them. We haven't had to, but with the aeration of the ponds, that's extremely helpful and then netting repairs both in the driving range and along the fence lines um, that's a continual operation as well uh, building major maintenance uh, what's addressed for this coming year is the main boiler which you can see on the left here and then it just out of the picture is actually the um, holding tank um, those will be replaced this year they've been patched and repaired as many times as we possibly can. Um, with this system being replaced, we will definitely be getting some PSC energy savings. Um, and we're working with facilities and um, obviously with the plumbing contractor as well. 
The additional item on the right is security cameras. Replacement of those will be updating the current system, which is now um, unfortunately failing because of the age of the system. So we'll be replacing that with uh, better cameras, and we're working again with facilities and Greg, who's the expert on our uh, citywide cameras, um, and also um, the way that those um, pictures and images are stored so we're able to um, help the police if there's ever an event, those kind of things that we're able to hang on to those. The current system only hangs on or captures and retains those for about four days and it overwrites itself. Uh, the newer systems obviously have much better longevity. And then um, as you've noticed, um, this year we did a partial carpet replacement in the both um, in the clubhouse itself. We replaced the carpet in the driving range, the bar, and the restaurant. And uh, this is the carpet tiles in the driving range that have been replaced. Um, they're still working on the project. You can see some of the trim that's not been taken care of yet. But um, with our carry forward money, should the other projects come in under budget, which we are estimating we will finish the hallway and clubhouse lobby um, with carpeting as well. The project's completed in 2013. Again, as I mentioned, the carpet replacement in those three areas and the walk-off mats, which are much more industrial, um, also coming out of the restaurant, reduces the grease that walks through the facility as well. Uh, we replaced the banquet room uh, audio-visual system with uh, new speakers throughout the, the banquet room, a new large um, electronic screen similar to what's in the RCC. The recreation center, a new amplifier, new projection system, um, new microphone system. It's all brand new and it's done very well. We're actually looking for the concessionaire soon to be connecting their cable system up to that as well so we can host other larger events in there versus in the bar. They can bring the bars into the banquet facility. We're looking at larger revenue generating, <coughs> pardon me, um, uh, venues to do that so um, once that's completed we'll be able to do things like Super Bowls and those kind of things where we could only fit um, 40 to 50 in the bar we'll now be able to fit 200 or so in the banquet facility so obviously a huge revenue generator and we also <clears throat> not with CIP money but we did rebuild the number two tee box this year with in-house materials staff we have a, a nursery green that we were able to also uh, resod that with and use um, the materials that were on the golf course for the, the, um, the underlayment and, and fill for that as well. On the parks maintenance side, um, obviously Leslie oversees the CIP budget um, for that, but the parks crews do help in completing some of the maintenance projects. One of them is the Kulan Sod replacement project, which has been done um, pretty much annually. As you can see, the crew's working on the left and then the sod replacement on the right. Um, majority of the sod replacement, actually all the sod replacement is down in the south end of the park around all of the picnic shelters, um, the real high traffic areas, and then obviously with the tree canopies and the, the use of uh, that from the public, it's pretty, a uh, uh, lot of wear and tear on there. So by replacing this, um, the crews have actually helped uh, reduce the cost on this as well. The other portion of um, our parks carry forward money that um, was approved is the don the growing tree with the parks the new parks donation memorial policy, as was presented to you about three weeks ago. Um, this tree will be put will be purchased and put in the RCC vestibule entry area um, to support our donation policy. And then another item also is um, that was carry forward money that from um, operation savings carry forward was um, to replace large play equipment pieces. There was one significant piece in uh, Philip Arnold that had a slide that was damaged, um, and it was um, it was a little over seven thousand dollars for replacement on just the slide. And as um, Leslie will present as well too, all of our play equipment is definitely seeing um, its lifespan and there's a lot of times that we need to replace. So larger pieces um, sometimes will fall under CIP depending on, on the cost and where the funds come from that. But um, anyway, so just wanted to let you know where the carry forward came. And with that, did you have any questions before uh, Leslie comes up for me? Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, going back to the <coughs> 
uh, camera system? Yes. The new system that we're going to replace it with, is it going to be uh, compatible with the same system that we purchased a year ago in the uh, transit center? Right. Yes, it'll be the similar cameras, uh, similar access, online access as well. And yes. Oh, same. Good, good. Yes. And then the, uh, the, when we replace the boiler, how old is that boiler that we've got? It's the original boiler that's been in the, the building. Okay, so that's so since 1997. But we're going to see some real good energy savings with the, the newer, newest technology and uh, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Probably more hot water and all those other benefits that come along with it. Less gas used to heat, the whole thing is going to be great. Great. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Good evening, uh, Council President uh, Person and Council Members, Leslie Betlock, Parks Planning and Natural Resources Director, here to um, talk to you about some of our major maintenance projects that we have going here at the city. We uh, started doing a lot of uh, major maintenance projects at uh, Jean Coulon Memorial Park starting a couple of years ago when um, the PN and D, Paradovich, Nottingham and Drage, uh, Kulon Condition Assessment Report was completed. And, uh, that's a structural engineering firm, and they went through the entire park uh, on land, above water, in water, and uh, came up with 18 different project areas and multiple projects for uh, structural major maintenance work to be completed along with uh, cost estimates. Uh, it's pretty surprising uh, because the park uh, has been maintained uh, in such optimum condition that the old part of the park, the south 23 acres, is uh, 46 years old. It was constructed in 1968 and the new portion of the park is 32 years old and that's the, from approximately the boat launch area north. So what you see here um, in this photograph uh, is the log boom uh, and the dolphins. And dolphins are those um, vertical structures that are kind of poking up out of the water that connect the log booms. And it uh, protects the shoreline and it also is for boater safety. And in 2013, we had um, about $570,000 budgeted to replace all the log booms, which are uh, wood, waterlogged wood, <laughs> uh, with plastic foam filled logs and uh, orange buoys in between. And this was completed um, this year. And as part of the permit, uh, we had to do some habitat uh, enhancement work. Uh, we planted, well, we actually planted six willows, five were uh, required along the shoreline, and we did that as part of Arbor Day Earth Day uh, just Saturday. So the remaining budget, it's about $340,000, uh, we're just uh, holding that as a placeholder at Kulon because we have a lot uh, more extensive structural repairs that we'll be doing at Kulon Park and there is a, a dedicated kind of fund for that so that we can accomplish all those items identified in 2012. And the next item uh, is uh, considerable paving, uh, settling, and heaving, just general unevenness of the plaza areas near Kid Valley and the Picnic Pavilion, and also at the North Picnic Shelter. And uh, you can see in the top photo that there's about a two and a half to three inch change in elevation. That was actually taken at the Picnic Pavilion, but we have the same situation at the North Shelter and then some general settling in, in the bottom photo, and that's in the uh, area around uh, Kid Valley. This started out as a 2013 budget item to repair the pavers uh, at Kid Valley and the Picnic Pavilion. We had a little over 300,000 budgeted, and we hired a consultant, a structural engineer, uh, and a surveyor to do a geotechnical analysis and survey the area for uh, improvements. Uh, the study was just recently completed and they came up with three alternatives. Uh, one was a partial uh, paver replacement 
uh, and putting new pavers back in. That was the least costly. Uh, the second option was to replace some of the pavers with poured in place concrete and then leave the remaining in pavers. And the third option, which is uh, the option that we will be recommending, is to remove all of the pavers, put in structural fill, and uh, replace the areas with uh, cast in place concrete. Um, there will be a design. Uh, we don't have a design uh, identified at this point because we've just completed this study, but it will be something that uh, complements the park and uh, maintain the aesthetic quality as well. So the most expensive option is um, about $410,000. We have uh, $411,000 set aside for this. Um, but again, um, I just mentioned that we've got this other money set aside that we're keeping in Coulon for things that if there's overruns, then we can tap into that money with your approval, of course. Mr. Chair? Yes. Leslie, uh, the geotechnical study that was done, <coughs> uh, two questions. Did it reveal any other structural uh, deficits that could uh, create a public safety issue and the other question would be what causes that degree of uh, change in uh, elevation uh, uh, with those pavers uh, was that a flaw from the original uh, uh, installation or no there's no flaw um, the park in this in both of these areas the North Picnic Pavilion and the Ivers uh, Kid Valley area it's all fill um, it was constructed at a time when uh, filling into the shoreline area was allowed. It's not allowed at this time. And even if uh, you compact to a maximum 95% density, um, over time there is the potential for settling. In addition to this area being all fill, there is a lot of under drainage through this area. And so uh, that there were many, many corings that were, uh, borings, I'm sorry, taken throughout the whole area that's proposed to be redone. And uh, the structural soils that will be put back in place will be able, to, they'll, they'll have to excavate down until they get to a certain uh, elevation below grade where there will be uh, no more failure. They'll fill it back up with structural fill, compact it to 95% density, and then put the concrete over the top. The crews have done um, an exceptional job over the last uh, 32 years and they have repeatedly pulled out the pavers, put in more fill, compacted the fill, put the pavers back. Very, very, very time consuming. So this solution should be, um, I know that uh, the public will appreciate it. And the other question was, did the geotechnical study reveal any other um, um, safety concerns? No. Uh, the, the study that was done two years ago um, identified everything possible that could and should be repaired in the park. And then this study that uh, when for this particular project, there was nothing that came up that was exceptional. Just um, the soils, it's fill, there's a lot of water in the area and uh, it's, it's normal settling over time. Something similar, you know, roads will have that same thing, they call it alligatoring, where the, uh, it, it, uh, it kind of breaks apart over time. In this situation, because they were two by two pavers, uh, it was able to fluctuate. Did I, I'm hoping I answered your question. Um, yes, you're saying that there was no uh, 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 safety concerns uh, oh. major you, you, that uh, were re uh, revealed by the, the study and uh, you explained how the uh, installation is going to, I guess, get down deep enough to find some kind of bedrock or something to do the infill, to rebuild it up and make it more uh, structurally sound? Correct. The next project, um, five years ago, uh, when this happened, I, we were talking about this saying, oh, it's going to take five years to get permits, and everyone kind of laughed, and lo and behold, it really did take five years to get permits through all the different regulatory agencies. And so th what we're looking at here is the Lower Walk and the Cedar River Trail between Bronson and the Senior Center at Logan. 
and it was flood damage that uh, occurred in 2009. And there were actually two areas where there was flood damage. Uh, downstream of Logan Avenue, uh, where portions of the bank along Cedar River Trail Park were damaged, the Corps of Engineers came in and repaired that because of the levee. And then this portion of the walk, which is between Bronson and Logan, uh, the city has been working with FEMA and all the regulatory agencies to do, uh, an, I'm going to call it an in-kind repair. And so the gabions, which are the wire baskets, as noted in the bottom photograph, are filled with uh, angular rock. They were torn open with the debris coming down the river. The repair is to put in more wire baskets filled with angular rock in the same locations where they were torn out. Uh, environmental, uh, the regulatory agencies, um, this is not the preferred method of uh, shoreline uh, construction or reconstruction. Um, part of the reason um, that the tribe and Department of Fish and Wildlife were amenable to this uh, was because uh, the Surface Water Utility Department uh, recently secured a grant um, to take a look at different ways to do shoreline restoration work from the mouth of the river up to Ron Regis Park. So they see that there's potential to do things differently. They understand the need to have a trail. And um, we should start this in uh, August after Renton River Days um, and then be complete sometime in September of this year. Mr. Yeah. Will the trail be closed? The trail will definitely be closed, yes. And so people will have to be uh, probably, not during Renton River Days. No. They'll <laughs> be rooted uh, probably up onto North Riverside Drive. Uh, okay. Yes. And the city's portion of the costs um, is 12.5% of the total project cost. So FEMA covers 75%, uh, the state covers 12.5%, and the city pays 12.5%. It's about a $200,000 project. <coughs> I know you've seen this before. This is Riverview Park Bridge. Uh, the bridge is over 50 years old. Um, just as a reminder, structural repairs were completed in 1980, 1994, 2005, 2010, 2011. So we were uh, diligent in trying to keep this open. Uh, and then in 2012, it was uh, rated in poor condition at the end of its useful life. So we did apply for state and federal grants, um, and we were unsuccessful. And then we worked with our lobbyist, the city's lobbyist, Doug Levy, and we uh, we're fortunate in securing um, a 1.1 million direct appropriation from the state. Um, after the state uh, keeps $33,000 for their grant administration fees, the city will receive 1.67 million, and um, we have a $100,000 city match. This is um, what the future bridge should look like. Uh, we have submitted all the drawings for construction for permitting, I should say. Uh, we are hoping that uh, we can demolish the bridge this year, so the park will be without a bridge for a year, and construct a new bridge in 2015. And the philosophy behind that is the uh, Department of Commerce grant is only good through June 30th of 2015. And so we're hoping to get, and we'll, we will have to go back and ask for a reappropriation of the money. So the more that we can get done this year, uh, the more uh, likelihood the funding will get reappropriated because the bridge will be gone at that point and the project will be permitted. It's just installation of a new bridge next year. So Heritage Park is um, the city's newest park, but there are drainage problems, as you can see in this photograph. And not only is it difficult for people to recreate, it's difficult to maintain, and it also contributes to poor health of the uh, forestry in the area. So the $50,000 that is budgeted for this project is to hire uh, an engineering firm to uh, come up with a solution on how to 
correct the drainage problems in this area. The next projects are uh, to replace lighting at the Renton Senior Activity Center. For any of you who have gone over there, it, it can be quite dark. And it is uh, very dark uh, walking around from the parking lot that's closest to the maintenance facility to the front of the building uh, around the coffee bar. So the project is to install new lighting similar to what uh, has been recently installed at the community center, LED lights. Uh, these lights have been, uh, these are the original lights actually back in the late 80s. So new LED lights and uh, new light bollards uh, around the coffee bar area. So it'll be a much brighter, lighter parking lot and there will be considerable cost savings with the use of LED lights. The second project is for new lighting up at Highlands, um, Park and Neighborhood Center. Uh, that project has been designed. Uh, we will be making a 2015 budget request to actually do the construction for that next year. And we estimate that to be between 140 and $150,000 for new lighting up at Highlands. This lighting uh, will occur this fall at the Senior Center. This photograph is at Ron Regis Park and there's a before and an after uh, here. We had $40,000 budgeted in 2013 and this was a total uh, overhaul of this basketball court. If you've ever had the opportunity to drive by at night, this, this park probably is as active as um, the uh, basketball court at Liberty Park. Very active but there was a lot of water and ups and downs and um, it was totally reconstructed for about thirty four thousand dollars chair yes this reminds me up at tiffany park we're replacing the um basketball hoops they're all done they're done, they're done. Mm -hmm. right. thank you i know the kiddos will be happy up there they're having fun In 2014, uh, we, we actually uh, carried forward some money from irrigation, automation, and repair and redirected that into the sport court repairs. We definitely have more courts that need repairing than we have budget. And the uh, two photographs on the left are indicative of what we have with our basketball courts. These are at uh, Maplewood uh, Park the court on the right of the tennis courts at uh, Kiwanis Park. Um, we're hoping to do, um, we'd like to do a full repair at Maplewood. Uh, at a minimum, we'll do some patchwork and then uh, do the Kiwanis tennis. But we have a list of about 10 different courts in our park system that need significant repairs. The pathway, sidewalk, patio, and boardwalk repairs are repairs um, for new sidewalks uh, to put in ADA walks, such as the uh, new walk at Tiffany connecting the parking lot to the picnic shelter, or uh, sidewalk or trail replacements such as the uh, Cedar River Trail upper walk between Williams and the Senior Center. The, uh, both of these projects are complete and uh, we hope to do Philip Arnold uh, ADA walk in 2014. This is, uh, this is probably one of the most complicated partnership uh, grants that I, I have been involved in and, and Terry Flatley has done just a fantastic job pulling this together. The city was approached by uh, Seattle Public Utilities and the Friends of Cedar River Watershed uh, for not weed control. And Seattle Public Utilities has been working with the Friends for several years now and they started at the, uh, the mouth of the Cedar River and they're working downstream because this is such an invasive species. It looks beautiful from the photographs, it's very lush. It's, uh, it's, it's a terrible weed and it doesn't provide good habitat for salmon. Bugs don't like it and so there, there's just no habitat value. So the city received a $189,000 grant from King Conservation District 
we have an agreement with them and uh, soon we'll be bringing um, to you a second agreement with the Friends of Cedar River Watershed. And that's for the Friends to do um, coordinate volunteer events uh, to remove and control the knotweed. There's also a city uh, in-kind match um, that the parks crews will be contributing toward this project and it's a three-year project. And uh, once this is complete, um, it's likely that we'll be applying for another grant uh, moving from I-405 downstream. The goal is to eradicate knotweed along the Cedar River. Mr. Chair? Yes. Do you go in and dig it out? Well, uh, no. This will actually, uh, there'll be a chemical application. Ah. And the uh, people who apply the chemicals uh, are licensed uh, to apply herbicides uh, adjacent to waterways and it's uh, an allowed chemical along a waterway as well. Wow and then what will be replaced? With and then uh, th there's a palette of approximately 10 different shrubs and tree species that will be uh, replanted uh, back in the place where the knotweed has been. This eradicated. will come back? It could first come back. Um, the first year is actually the spray application 2014 will be the spray application. 2015 will be some planting and also uh, probably some spot spraying where some of the knotweed has come back. And then 2016 will be more planting with potentially another spray application. So it's very uh, invasive and pervasive and um, it'll take a lot of um, work on everyone's part to eradicate it. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Uh, Leslie, can you tell us a little bit about the chemical and I'm sure Department of Ecology, you know, had to sign off to approve that type of treatment uh, in a salmon habitat. Uh, is there any concern of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the chemical leaching into the river and creating any kind of a, a hazard for the salmon? No, it's, uh, this is an approved chemical. We do have to get permits. This is a chemical that's been applied um, from the mouth of the river all the way up to the Renton City limits at Ron Regis. We use licensed applicators um, who are trained and uh, they're licensed to apply the chemical. Um, and it's, it's acceptable. I mean, they, they will not be spraying it directly into the water and so anything that could hit the water will be oversprayed but typically what happens is because the foliage is so large the chemical uh, will stick they'll use a, a, probably a surfactant something that will help the chemical adhere to the foliage and then that's it it's done it just dies it just dies so we'll want to put signs up to tell people what we're doing yes Right. right. There, there's a huge public outreach component to okay. this, and the friends, um, the friends of the Cedar River Watershed, are taking the lead on that. Great. They will have 13 events where there'll be public outreach with letters and also community events. Uh, the opportunity to be at Renton River Days with a booth to educate the public, and Good. so huge public outreach. Just can't you just imagine as all this dies away, what the public would think as they go down there? In the um, in the short term, I think people will be a little bit surprised. In the long term, when the native vegetation takes hold and starts thriving, it'll be much nicer. Sure. Yeah. Tree maintenance. Um, I like this photo on the uh, the top here because it's showing two different kinds of tree hazards. There's a dead. Uh, snag standing upright and there's also a tree that's leaning and those are just some of the things that Terry Flatley the city's urban forester deals with um, there's 130,000 public uh, street trees here in Renton and um, kind of a piece of trivia uh, that one average tree with a 50 crown spread provides 2,400 gallons of stormwater control oh. that's a great thing and they also sequester um, carbon dioxide. So we had $232,000 budgeted in 2013, and uh, a portion of that was spent on primarily tree removals, hazard tree removals, and uh, 
pruning of dead limbs, uh, structural pruning, and then also a special project, and that was a sidewalk project done with the public works crews and the parks crews uh, along Bons Bronson Way at Liberty Park, and that's removing uh, heaved sidewalk, uh, root pruning the existing oak trees and maple trees that are along there, and then putting new sidewalk back in. In 2014, we have um, two projects already under uh, contract to do uh, tree removal and pruning at 13 locations. Um, another one to do tree pruning primarily at 24 locations. And then we'll have another upcoming tree removal and tree pruning project. And that one is primarily in parks. The first two were just in public right-of-ways. The special project for 2014 will be uh, sidewalk repair, root pruning down near the piazza and along Logan, that central area down there. Leslie, is that photo to the right the handiwork of a beaver? <laughs> it is. We have been hit hard by beavers on um, the Cedar River this year, and that's exactly what that is. That tree was um, removed by the parks crews, and they have since installed wire mesh around the base of the trees, which um, almost eliminates the beavers getting access to the trees and chewing them, because they'd have to chew through the wire to get to that. The next one is the Sunset Neighborhood Park Master Plan. Um, this is part of the Sunset Planned Action EIS. And, and as part of that was a two and a half acre park to be located uh, in conjunction with um, the new library and work that the Rent and Housing Authority is doing. The park has since been expanded to three and a half acres uh, thanks to the Rent and Housing Authority. And we have our first open house meeting this Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, to develop a master plan. And I'm hoping that all of you got notification of that upcoming meeting and can attend. And our last and um, I think many people's favorite is the Meadowcrest Playground. And um, huge community support, uh, big community event coming up on May 17th to open and dedicate the park, and we are on track for that. We're very excited. That concludes my presentation, unless you have questions. Thank you. Are we going to have time to get to public works? Watch me go. <laughs> yeah. Is that a hint not okay. to ask questions? Uh, council no. President, no. Uh, person and council members, I'm Peter Renner, the facilities director, and I've <coughs> assembled a variety of uh, projects that we're working on, some larger ones and some smaller ones that uh, have come to our attention th uh, through uh, public observation. So first one is the um, is the, thank you, is the parking slab repair on the uh, police entry side of City Hall. You'll, doesn't uh, take too much observation to notice how cracked up that, that is. Uh, we had an engineer analyze why that area cracks and the other area hasn't, and it was poured too thin. And um, so what we will be doing is uh, pouring some slightly thicker concrete with a much higher strength uh, so that that doesn't happen again. Uh, we have um, $60,000 a year for replacement of uh, broken cameras and upgrades, and um, I know you're all aware of the work that was done at the transit center, and we, we've got about 20 cameras there altogether. Uh, we've added cameras in uh, some of the parks. Uh, Meadowcrest is the latest, where uh, the school district has cameras coming from their direction. We have cameras coming from our direction. We get complete coverage of, of uh, the entire area. Um, this particular uh, shelter is, has been the site of a lot of problems over the years, and so we were able to add a very high-power camera 
on the Liberty Park picnic shelter. And again, all, all of our cameras are designed to provide uh, admissible um, evidence in court with facial recognition. And so um, even though this shows a very broad area, the cameras can digitally zoom in and you could count freckles on people's faces. Um, this is the kind of thing that gets my pulse up a little bit. Um, <laughs> Here we have the uh, compressor motors for City Hall. We replaced <coughs> the top one and the bottom one uh, a few years ago. Um, they look identical, but uh, they are more energy efficient than the original. And this year we'll, we'll be replacing the one in the middle. Um, that's about a $35,000 uh, motor. Uh, we have a fund that allows for the replacement of uh, worn and damaged exercise equipment throughout the city, including uh, fire stations and uh, RCC and uh, to some degree, and then here at City Hall. Um, the park maintenance uh, roof shop is original and uh, it's metal and that has rusted badly and so that's being replaced this year, a $100,000 project. Um, this is uh, the canopy at the uh, shop on Bronson Way and um, that has rusted through and will be replaced. The roof on the main building is quite new and it's fine. Um, there's some efflorescence that has occurred at Fire Station 13 from uh, moisture transference through the cut face block. Uh, same thing would occur at um, the RCC, except that every five years or so we apply a clear sealer on it and then that uh, prohibits or um, stops the flow of moisture through the block that leads to this unsightly appearance. Uh, this is a, an elevator pit, in case you've never seen one before. And uh, this is the elevator pit at the senior center, and there's been some um, damage, uh, deformation of the bottom of the hydraulic cylinder. And so we've got to uh, re-sleeve that and so uh, we'll do most of that during the regular annual shutdown, but there will be a period of time, maybe two weeks or a month, when the second floor won't be accessible except by the stairway. So um, that's about a forty-five dollars to $60,000 job. We're not sure what we're gonna find underneath the floor. Uh, we're also going to be replacing the original acoustic uh, ceiling tiles that you can see there and the uh, industrial uh, type of lighting fixtures. It's a shame that uh, they uh, obscure the beauty of the timber framing and we'd like to have the lighting highlight that rather than uh, block people's view of it. Um, We've also had some long-term problems with leakage at the, uh, at the roof above the ceiling that I just showed you on the previous slide. And um, we brought in a uh, building envelope engineer who's done yeoman service for it, some other buildings, and uh, he determined that uh, <coughs> some of the original plywood panels um, had curled so it appears that maybe they weren't up to the high standard that you'd expect and they curl, push the shingles up and then that allows uh, wind-driven rain to get in. Um, so <clears throat> that's just in a couple areas on that roof and so fortunately it didn't turn out to be an entire re-roof, it's just in one section and um, we think we can blend the shingles in well enough not to be too, too obvious. Um, then for a long time we've been wanting to replace the 200 mil roof uh, it's actually the original roof that has had years and years worth of fluid coatings uh, put on top of it and patches and so forth so it's patches on patches and um, it's a very complex problem because of all the um, penetrations that are through the roof and all the equipment that's up there but we will be removing this old roof to uh, get some of the weight off of it uh, it's at a maximum right now. We've got the cooperation of the cell companies that have uh, fixtures up there uh, to re-engineer their, um, their cell structures so that those are lighter and are still wind resistant. 
Uh, that altogether is about a $200,000 roofing project. And then uh, the final slide I have is the conversion of a portion of the old jail um, on the P2 level to police evidence storage. And over the years, the police have um, had a problem. They've been crimped in their storage capacity and the city's grown and the retention requirements for much of that evidence has changed. Uh, so they wind up having to keep uh, some of it uh, for much longer. And additionally, it's very important to have conditioned space, uh, heat and humidity and so forth, so that um, the evidence that is required to be kept can be preserved uh, for potential use in court. So uh, it's completely isolated from the REACH Center and um, uh, it continues to allow for the operation of the BAC by outside uh, police when they need to use it. So if there's no more questions. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes, uh, Peter, what is our policy on, you mentioned uh, the replacement of uh, the uh, exercise equipment at the uh, community center. What is our policy on uh, what we do with the old equipment? Um, well, um, Chris Stimson is the, is the expert, our subject matter expert on exercise equipment, and she's been very good at moving the equipment from the RCC into other sites where it isn't used as much before it gets to the end of its life. And then right. it's surplus for our policy. And at the end of, and then when it, when it does finally die, um, then we uh, okay. usually um, right. have I'm, to ditch I'm, it. I'm just thinking that it is, you know, uh, you know, public, you know, paid property and, right. you know, as long as there's a benefit or use for it, are we trying to put it in a facility somewhere where, you know, as people paid for memberships at the mm -hmm. community center to use the exercise equipment, but is it being, are we thinking in that way to, you know, extend the life and use for public benefit until it does get to a, a point where we, it's got to be? We move it around as long as we can. Usually by the time um, it, we have moved it to the lesser sites, it's pretty worn out and you can't get parts for it. So um, then it is surplus through the, the mandated way. But we, it, we stretch them. We, we don't have a big budget for that, so we have to make them go as far as And we do have a program of regular inspection and maintenance so that it doesn't uh, uh, get too far gone before right um, you know if, if it can if the parts can be replaced to extend the life of it we do that as well right. thanks as Greg's coming up I uh, thank you Peter and Leslie and Kelly for presenting tonight I just wanted to wrap up by uh, one other project we have going on it's not a, um, a facility type thing but we are moving forward and, and out interviewing for the senior business plan strategic plan that we've talked to you for a couple years about that we wanted to do uh, and so we will be coming back in June to present that to you but I wanted to make sure you knew that we were out interviewing and talking to people about the seniors and what their programs are and what their future is so um, you'll be hearing about that and we'll be coming forward the last thing is that and Greg thank you for your patience because we always give him a bad time if we can go first but we just want you to be aware that there are some bigger things that are out there that we have put aside and we want you to be aware of it paving is a big one for community services we have a lot of parking lots and that to pave and we have patched for several years so that's getting to be a bigger item for us to catch up on uh, switching lights over like they did on the street lights getting our lights on our trails and all that switched over to LED we also have new requirements by the tribes by anything that's along our waterways to meet fish habitat criteria so that has to be met um, we're keeping up on all of our tree inspections for Peter's group it's the HVAC systems in a lot of our buildings uh, we've continued to try to make those work and finally I would just say uh, we have playgrounds that playgrounds is, is Kelly and Leslie both said they have us about a 17 year span for playgrounds uh, our youngest playground is 17 years and so and that's um, and so we are having trouble now getting parts to fit a lot of those are structures you see they're designed and those have changed so playgrounds will be on a high list for us on our capital as we bring that forward in the next budget also so uh, thank you for having us here tonight and uh, again our goal is to be here quarterly we certainly won't have as much the next time because they'll be continued but uh, to make sure that we're connecting with you not only as we go through finance when we uh, bring every every project through but uh, answering the public's questions and yours about any of the projects that are going on so thank you for having us thanks Thank you, Terry.
Greg, you're up. Okay, Mr. President, members of the council, um, I'm, Re I'm Greg Zimmerman, Renton's Public Works Administrator, and I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. I've got quite a few slides, but I won't spend a lot of time on any of the slides unless you have questions, of course. Hopefully you had in your package some maps. Uh, we tried to get four maps in your package, and the reason why that's important is we kind of jump around with these um, public works projects, and it's sometimes helpful uh, when we're talking about the project to have the map there and you can kind of identify where it is in the city. Um, this is, I'm going to go through our capital improvement projects. We have a lot of them. This is not an entire complete list. Some of our annualized type projects where we're doing things year by year, we don't, I'm not spending much time on those. I'm, I'm really talking about the large projects. I want to give you the status and where they are so you know how those are moving along. Also, our major maintenance and public works is rolled into our operation and maintenance budget, and that probably is a discussion for a different day if you'd like to talk about things like um, crack ceiling streets and the things that we do in a preventive maintenance fashion. Um, I'm not going to cover that today because it would take too long. I'll just uh, stick with the capital projects for now. Um, Broke it into divisions. Uh, first of all, the maintenance services division has one major capital project the year, this, that, this year. It's the street overlay project. Uh, these next few slides have a lot of numbers on them. I'm not going to go through the numbers on these slides because I break that down into the individual projects. So I'll go through these slides pretty quickly. The uh, Transportation Systems Division, I'm going to talk about nine major projects, and I'll talk about the funding, how much of it is grant funded for each of these projects, and the status of getting these projects out, out the door, where they are in terms of developing the design and construction and so forth. So I'll go through these pretty quickly because I'll get down into more detail when I talk about the projects. So this sheet uh, kind of totals up the major transportation systems projects that we're doing. If you throw in the LED streetlight conversion project, um, which we're just finishing up now, we're about 95% complete, changing out our 4,000 streetlights, um, the total um, major transportation projects is $17.8 million, and 67% uh, of that is grant funded, but I'll get into the details a little bit more as we go through the projects. Oops. And then the airport projects, um, there's $2.1 million worth of airport projects I'll be talking about. They're the three major projects we're going to be doing this year. And I'll also have a few things to say about the, um, the um, Central Sound Aerospace Training Center and what's going on with that too as I get into the airport discussion. It's not listed here, but I'll talk about that a little bit. Public Works Utility System, um, we have a total of $24 million worth of capital projects we're doing in 2014. Um, 13 million of those are surface water projects, 4.2 million of the projects are water, and then $6.9 million of projects are wastewater. So I'll talk about those individual projects as well. The first one I talk, want to talk about is to go back to the Maintenance Services Division. Their major project this year is the uh, usual annual overlay project. You have a map that shows you uh, the location where the overlay projects are going to be, so I'll touch on those locations really briefly if you want to take a look at the map. Not go into too much detail or take too much time. But it's a uh, $885,000 project this year. Um, in the southeast section, we're going to be, you could see it on the map, it's the kind of purplish uh, streets that are shown way on the right side, the east side of the map. Um, those streets are 161st Avenue Southeast, 160th Court, and the streets in those vi general vicinities. I won't go through all of the streets, but those streets are in need of an overlay and they're going to be included in our program this summer. This continues the list. It's a long list of rel relatively small streets in that area. Then uh, on the northeast part of the city, um, we're going to be doing northeast 5th place, Edmonds Avenue Northeast to Harrington Avenue Northeast. 
And uh, we have two alleys we're going to be doing this year. We're going to be do doing one alley uh, between Index Avenue Northeast at Northeast 16th Street, south to Harrington Avenue, so it's in the Highlands area. And then the second one is in the southwest portion of Renton, between Southwest 12th Street at Grady Way and the south end to Seneca Avenue. So those are two alleys that we're going to be paving as part of our program. In addition, um, I didn't list this on the slides, but you'll see on your map that Monterey, Monterey Terrace is going to be overlaid, that whole subdivision, and also to the north off of Northeast 12th Street, Olympic uh, um, and um, Olympia and Queen Avenue are going to be overlaid. Those two projects are paid for by utility funds. So that's money that's coming into the overlay project above and beyond the 885000 And the reason the utilities are paying for those is because the overlays are a result of utility improvement projects. So that's part of the street restoration the utilities will be doing. So that's uh, the streets we're going to be doing this year in this year's overlay project. So I'll move uh, on to the Transportation Systems Division. First, um, this is a, a depiction of the uh, overlay of Southwest Grady Way. Um, it's going to be done between Rainier Avenue and Long Acres Drive Southwest. We were able so to secure a $700,000 STP federal grant through the PSRC competition for preservation projects. So this, this grant will be used for this project and we will pay for about 48% of the project. The preservation grants you have to match 50-50. So the other half of it is, is city um, street money, um, or actually our city capital improvement money in the 317 fund. So this project will be completed by fall of 2014. So it's going to be paved this year. Uh, Greg? Yes. When they do that, will this be done at night or during the, not at rush hour, hopefully? Well, either. Did we get down to that? I think we're going to be. We're planning to do the same thing we did on rainy which was to uh, do the, the, the overlay at night. Okay. It real well on Rainier, that's our preference for green. Mr. Chair? Yes. Greg, is that going to be asphalt or is it going to be concrete? It'll be asphalt. Okay, just out of curiosity, I noticed that uh, right down a, a 7th, uh, right there uh, from 7th on down to, I'm not exactly sure how far it goes, that area of street is concrete. Why, why was that piece of the street done that way and it's not consistent with other heavily, more heavily traveled uh, roadways? That's, that's an interesting question. Typically you use concrete pavement, which is called rigid structural pavement. Um, for areas where you have subsurface problems, where you want to have a stronger street surface that will bridge potential uh, areas, you can see that it doesn't always work real well. The Logan Project is a concrete street, but back in those days we didn't dowel the um, concrete panels together like we do now, so that's the reason we have the problems. And um, you use the um, flexible street pavement, which is asphalt, in areas where your sub-base is a little bit stronger usually, because the concrete costs more. It's a more rigid um, type of a pavement. and so. Usually where concrete's used, the ge geotechnical reports indicate that you need a stronger base and you um, end up paying a little bit more, but it, but it holds up with the, uh, with the worse uh, subsurface conditions. This project you're all familiar with, it's the uh, Garden Avenue intersection project. The cost of it this year, not the total cost, but the 2014 budget, is uh, $515,000. Only 5% of that was grant funded, but the previous uh, year's uh, grant funding was a larger match than that. And this project is now uh, complete. This is the Logan Avenue reconstruction project. Um, we're getting to it just in time <laughs> because of some of the problems we're having with the pavement unraveling. Um, the, uh, this con reconstruction project will be from Cedar River to North 6th Street. It has a 2014 cost of so $746,000. These numbers I'm giving you is just this year's budget. These are multi-year projects, so the total budget is much larger than that. 
um, with most of these projects. Um, it's almost entirely grant funded, 97%. So um, we are right now in the planning environmental documentation process. The uh, final design is underway and the bids, we intend to open the bids for construction of this project in January 2015. You'll recall we had an opportunity if we wanted to really push it to, to open the bids um, late this fall but for reasons of um, not wanting to open that um, area up in the rainy season, uh, we thought it was a better course to uh, wait, hold off until January 2015 and continue to spend a lot of uh, maintenance money fixing these potholes and that keep on reappearing. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Greg, how much of that, uh, you said 90 plus percent of it is grant funding? Yes. How much of those uh, grant funds are federal dollars? Um, the grant funds for this project is, uh, Logan, yeah, these are federal. All federal. Yeah, I believe. I don't, do we have a uh, state? I think it's federal. Here we got, um, uh, federal funds for the design phase and a state grant for the construction phase. What's the split there? Uh, I would say probably two-thirds of the money are uh, uh, state, one-third federal. And you, know, you don't have to give me those exact dollars uh, amounts now, but I'd be interested in knowing what they are. Okay. Okay. We'll make Thank a you. note of that. We'll also tell you, I think some of those state funds are actually pass through federal dollars, too, but we'll, we'll confirm that. Thank you. Okay, this is the South 7th Street and Shattuck Avenue South Intersection Signalization Project. We're putting a signal at that intersection. It has a 2014 cost of $1.2 million. It's 92% grant funded. This, is, this is, uh, signal is going to be really helpful with our transit movement through that intersection as well. Right now, the planning, environmental documentation, and final design are currently underway. Advertisement for bids for this project will be done in June 2014 with the construction complete by the end of this year. The City Safety uh, Improvement Project is a rel relatively small project con compared to the size of these other ones, but an important one. It uh, is a $250,000 project, 96% um, grant funded, so we have quite a bit of grant funding for this one and it will install a Hawk pedestrian signal, which is one of those signals that extends out over the street at Duval and Northeast 12th, which is, one, which is maybe the crosswalk, among all other crosswalks that we want to improve the safety on because of its history. Um, and we're also going to use that money to install 20 traffic signal countdown timers, the ones that go 10, 9, 8, 7, they tell you how many seconds you have left to cross. Um, this project is put on a temporary hold as we get uh, an approval from WashDOT of our new ADA, Americans with Disability Act, signal replacement policy. They want us to get, um, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a size limit for how big the, pr the repair project has to be before you replace the, um, the push button signals to the new standard. And so we have a policy submitted on that to them. And once that gets approved, we'll be able to move forward with this project. The, uh, we want to advertise for bid um, in June of 2014 and complete the construction in December of this year. Oops. Okay, this project, you know, as you know, we've uh, um, accepted the low bid on the Highlands to Landing Pedestrian Connection Project. Uh, this has a 2014 cost of 1.9 million. Um, and 87% of that is grant funded. The low bid has been awarded and notice to proceed was issued on April 23. The scheduled completion is August 2014. So we're beginning to work on that. This one will be another familiar project to all of you. It's the uh, Southwest 27th Strander Boulevard project. The 2014 cost once again, the overall cost is much higher than this, is $2.7 million. 83% uh, of that is grant funded. Uh, construction began two years ago, back in 2012, and will be completed in May 2014. So we're just close to completing it. 
the pavement will happen this Wednesday and this Thursday of this week. So that's when the paving for that street wow. will happen. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. Only taken 20 point. years to get to this point. <laughs> <laughs> and a few gray hairs. <laughs> but um, the thing that we're working on with this project right now is Sound Transit, of course, is doing their um, Tuck Willis Station improvement. We need them to complete the driveway to connect to the end of this project and to do some more work on their project so that everything will be ready for the June 7th startup of the Rapid Ride F line, which is still on schedule. And we have been told Sound Transit is making a concerted effort to make that happen. So we hope that that will happen. We'd like the uh, Rapid Ride F line to start without big detours. The uh, Southeast 43rd Street, Southeast Car Road, Southeast Petrovisky Road improvement project has a 2014 cost of 2.7 million. This entire project is virtually 100% grant funded. It's a project that we don't need much match money for all, at all. The, the phase one of the project involves installing a coordinated signal, signal timing system along that corridor, so the signals will coordinate with each other, and widening at the intersection with Benson, which is depicted on this uh, graphic, uh, State Route 515. Uh, the preliminary engineering, environmental work, and right-of-way work is underway currently. Construction is anticipated in 2015. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Prince. Uh, Greg, anything we can do to get that street named one name? Uh. <laughs> That's a very uh. good question. I think we counted six names throughout the whole street. Yeah. If you... You know, that's something that we may want to talk about um, because it is... Y you always have difficulties renaming major arterials that have businesses because they've got, you know, business addresses and they've got cards out to people and it's fairly inconvenient to them. Um, so you have to b uh, really involve the business and the residential community in name changes. But it's something that we might want to consider. Um, our neighbor to the north, Newcastle, recently renamed a street that had about five or six different names running through their city. Uh, the council can do that but it takes a lot of public outreach. I don't think you'll have an issue with the residential, you might have an issue with the business. Level. Right, right. That's, that's something we could approach if that was the council's wish. Another familiar project, um, the uh, Rainier Avenue project, the 2014 budget was 715,000, 79% of that was grant funded. The project was substantially complete on February 11th, 2014. Uh, we're still working on some of the details. Um, the uh, plant establishment will extend through February 2015. Mr. Chair. Mr. Greg. Greg, I, 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 I've had this conversation with you before, but you know this uh, aerial photo right here just you know brings the point home with more uh, 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 graphic, uh, uh, graphic uh, capability. It's a horrible paint job. I mean, the overspray, you can look at that. I mean, this, is, this is horrible. I mean, even now, when I drive by there, I look at that and I say, how could those guys do a paint job like that, you know, in such a, you know, important project for our, our, our city in that area? And it extends all up and down that corridor. And not only that, but I've personally identified uh, concrete, you know, uh, you know uh, work that was just pretty shoddy at best. And I uh, just want to know, we spent good money having this done. This is a good project for our, our city, for the community, for the businesses. And just wondering if, uh, you know, there's some way that we can have these people come back and fix that. Well, we'll um, we've been looking at some of the, because you had uh, talked to me a little bit about that before. We'll, we'll take a full corridor tour and compare notes um, with the uh, project team as well. And we'll get back to you on that. Uh, Mercy. Um, came up in finance committee today that we still haven't turned on the cameras at Rainier and Grady. Do you know when that will happen? Red light cameras. Yeah, red lights. Oh, the red light cameras. I'll have to find out. No income. Out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll check into that. Thank you. That's a collaborative project with the police department, so we'll check into that. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, the uh, Northeast 31st Culvert uh, replacement project 
This is a project that replaces a road section in culvert along Honey Creek that frequently gets washed out and there's only one road into several residences back there. It's a $426,000 project, 95% grant funded. Um, and we're finalizing the bid package this week and it shall go out, go out and to bid and be built this year. The uh, Sunset Boulevard project is, um, has a 2014 budget of $720,000. It's 53% grant funded. This is the project that we had to match 50-50 in order to get the funding. You may recall that action earlier this year. Uh, the project will improve Sunset Boulevard, uh, will improve Sunset Boulevard from Park, North Park Drive to Monroe. Um, and of course it will complement the, the Sunset uh, Terrace um, Sunset Highlands redevelopment project that, that we're all working on. Um, we'll advertise for requests for qualifications for engineering consultants so that we can get them to make presentations and select an engineering designer in the second or third quarter of 2014. So uh, that project's not under design yet, but it will be shortly uh, it, it, within the next few months. We'll select a consultant. We haven't included a slide for it, but we're finishing up the LED streetlight conversion project, as I mentioned before. Um, I think it's over 95% done. Uh, 4,000 streetlights have been converted to LED, um, light emitting diode, much lower energy cost, at a cost of $4.3 million. 25% of that was grant funded, and 75% um, was funded by low interest bonds that were issued. And of course, we expect that project to more than pay itself off in electrical cost savings. Okay, I'll go quickly through the airport projects. Um, the uh, blast fence replacement project has kind of been on our minds lately. We've been talking about that. And that project has a 2014 budget of $930,000. 75% of that is grant funded. The construction will begin between June, or the construction will occur between June and September of this year, this summer. So we're getting close. The FAA approved using funding for the Taxiway Bravo project. Some of the grant funding was uh, left over for paving the airport perimeter road. The 2014 budget for that is $500,000. 90% uh, of that's grant funded. The paving will be in spring of 2014, so it's coming up. We're currently coordinating with the Boeing Company on phasing of the striping for the project, and the project will complete, be completed by this August. The 820 building demolition project has a 2014 budget of $673,000. Demolition began on April 14th and completion will be by early summer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have a slide for the Central Sound Aerospace Training Center. As you know, that's a $12.5 million project that is paid for by state um, legislative uh, appropriation. We're currently laying out the schedule to restart the design effort since we had to rescope that with the additional $10 million that the state appropriated. And uh, we still hope to have this, this facility open in spring of 2016. So we're, we're working the, um, the um, getting the, cons uh, the architect back on track. Greg, before you start with the utilities system division, I, there, nice. you have so much to cover. I don't think you can get through it I'd this like evening. Right. So what I'd like to do is cut it off now, and then we'll reschedule the rest of this as soon as possible, uh, Jay. Okay, with that, are there any, any other questions? In that case, uh, we'll adjourn the Committee of the Whole and we'll return as a full council of seven.